Welcome to another edition of Conference Chatter TV, where I'm here to reflect on what happened in week eight in the college football season in the Big 12. My name is Eric Sorrentino. Thanks again for stopping by, guys. I'm the KUSports.com Big 12 blogger. And in week eight, we went four and two, and that'll bring my record to 52 and 15 for the season. 77.6% clip that we're picking at. So let's get to what happened in week eight. A lot of crazy things, as usual, in the Big 12 this year. It's been kind of the year of uncertainty here in the conference. And to me, it all started with Iowa State 9 and Nebraska 7. Crazy game. I had Nebraska at home, obviously. Missed that one. Uh, and the other game I missed was uh, Texas Tech uh, losing to Texas A&M. So we'll get to those in a minute. Let's start with Iowa State beating Nebraska in Lincoln for the first time since 1977. You know, I, I really don't even know what to, where to begin with this. I mean, Nebraska had more turnovers. They had eight turnovers. Uh, so they had more turnovers than they did points. I mean, this was just crazy. They had five fumbles lost, three interceptions, and they lost four fumbles inside the Iowa State six-yard line. So when they, I mean, they moved the ball okay, but they just, they just put the ball on the ground all day. And all season, I have been somewhat patient with the Nebraska quarterback, Zach Lee. I haven't, you know, a lot of the Nebraska fans are calling for freshman quarterback Cody Green. And frankly, after this weekend, you can add me to that list of people calling for Cody Green. Something has to be done here. Um, you know, the last two games, I think Nebraska's only had 17 points combined at home. I mean, it's just some, something has to be done here. There's a lack of spark, uh, of a spark on offense. There's, uh, you know... And for a defense that's, that's playing as well as Nebraska has, I just feel bad for that defense. And uh, something has to be done on offense, whether that's a quarterback change. I don't know. I'd probably start there, though, since Cody Green is really going to be the future of this program anyway, a quarterback. You might as well put him in. I don't think he'll do much worse at this point. But uh, you have to give a little bit of credit here, a lot of credit, I should say, to Iowa State. They played without their starting quarterback, Austin Arnaud, and their starting running back, Alexander Robinson, and still pulled it off. Clearly, that Cyclone defense was ready to play with the eight turnovers. But Iowa State, as well on offense, didn't really turn it over that much. I don't think they turned it over once. So, you know, they played efficient, efficient football. The, nothing too crazy on offense, but enough to get the job done in Lincoln. So that one was... I did not see that coming at all. That one was obviously my... My first loss. Let's go to my second one, which was Texas A&M 52, Texas Tech 30. Again, it's kind of, uh, I mean, this is crazy. Uh, here's, here's how kind of odd the Big 12 is this year. I have three scores here for you. With Texas Tech and A&M, they both played K-State this year. Texas Tech beat K-State 66-14, and A&M got, got killed by K-State 62-14. But then it was A&M who beat Tech, 52-30. So it's just, what, you know, what can you expect here? Um, A&M was unbelievable on the ground. 321 rushing yards and six TDs from the A&M ground game. Um, Cyrus Gray, 131 yards. And, and Christian Michael, 121. They were just unbelievable. And the five turnovers from Tech didn't help either. So I missed, missed that one. Uh, let's get to a couple that I won here. Going back to the Big 12 North for, for a second, Kansas State 20, Colorado 6. I had the Cats here at home, and, and with this win, K-State now holds a one-game lead over Iowa State uh, in the Big 12 North. Everyone else is 1-2 and two and Missouri's 0-3. It's almost like this division is flipped. I, I mean, you have Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri at the bottom, who everyone expected to kind of be the front runners, obviously. Then you have K-State and Iowa State, you know, sitting at 1-2, and two, and... I mean, that just tells you how crazy this conference has been. Um, I'd like to take a look real fast at K-State's path here because they're 3-1 and one already in the conference. Next couple games, they're at OU next week, obviously a tough one. But then they're at home to KU, at home to Missouri, and then at Nebraska to close the year. So those final three games, those are winnable games for K-State. I don't expect them to win next week, but... At three and one already, you'd think if they can get to five and three in conference, that they would win the Big Twelve North. It's crazy. It's uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, if you would have told me that they would be in this position, I would have uh, it would have been laughable to me. But that's the reality of it right now for K State. You got to really be liking their chances. 
Um, because really you'd think that either 4-4 four and four or 5-3 and three will win it in the North. Um, I'd be feeling pretty confident with 5-3, and three, though. I think 4-4 four and four is more realistic with how mediocre this conference uh, or this division, the Big 12 North, has been this year. Uh, the last team, and it's happened before, that a team finished 4-4 four and four and won the Big 12 North, that was, of course, Colorado in 2004. And in that Big 12 title game, <laughs> they did not fare so well. Oklahoma beat them 42-3. to So I expect something like that to happen again this year because the South is just so much better than the North. It's, you know, obviously not even really that close. So I won that one with K-State. Uh, the next one I picked correct was Oklahoma uh, defeating Kansas. I had it a little bit closer, but OU beat them 35-13 in Lawrence. You know, the Sooners' defense continues to prove that it's one of the best in the Big 12. Uh, KU can score points at home. In fact, here's uh, in four home games before OU, they've scored 49, 44, 35, and 41. This is, this is KU. And now just 13 against the Oklahoma defense. So a very impressive showing. And, and speaking of that defense, it all starts with uh, the se what the secondary did. And Dominique Franks with a pick six to make it 14-0, completely change that game. KU is driving deep in Oklahoma territory. Franks takes it back 85 yards the other way, and we have a completely different game in Lawrence. I like what Oklahoma is doing. I mean, on offense, they're not as explosive, explosive excuse me, as they've been in years past, but they're keeping it kind of simple for Landry Jones. Um, he had a lot of those kind of screen bubble passes, whatever you want to call it, to Ryan Broyles, who's just a lightning-quick receiver out there at the end. And when you have speed like Royals, you know, you can do that. And, you know, also when you have a defense like Oklahoma's, you know, you can do that as well. And so I think with Oklahoma's defense, you know, they'll pretty much uh, give Oklahoma an opportunity to win out for the rest of the year. If you have a defense like that, you're going to have an opportunity to win every game you play in. So a very impressive showing, as far as I'm concerned, from the Sooners in Lawrence. Uh, had Texas beating Missouri. It was a 41-7 final. I don't know if you guys saw this. There, you know, Last week, I, there was national speculation about Missouri winning this game. I think two panelists from around the horn picked Missouri to win. I did not have Missouri winning this game. I mean, Texas just, they, they dominated every facet of this game, let's be honest. You know, it was 35-7 at half. Texas only added two field goals in the second half. I mean, they, you know, Mac Brown was just, you know, not really running it up at all. Um, and I wrote in my blog last week that, that Texas dropped to number three in the polls for no reason, and, and you're kind of beginning to see why here. At least I hope you are. I, I still think Texas should be number two in the country, I mean, particularly with this win. Then you have Alabama, who, who is still in the top two. They dropped from one to two, and they only won 12-10 over Tennessee. And so it just seems to me like UT was punished for that 16-13 win over Oklahoma. And it's just, it doesn't really make any sense. Kind of like I said, though, at the end of that blog, you know, if UT wins out, they'll play for the national ch uh, national championship. So it's really no great concern there. But I still think Texas should be number two. Very impressive showing, though, in Columbia. And the final game was Oklahoma State 34, Baylor 7. Pretty obvious. This one was in Waco, but Oklahoma State looked good again. Um, they're, they've, they're quietly undefeated in conference play so far. And that, of course, sets up the game of the week Next week, on Halloween night in Stillwater, it will be Texas against Oklahoma State, and that'll be a great environment. That's really the last major hurdle that I see for Texas in its quest for an undefeated season. Uh, Oklahoma State, of course, winning lately, and they've won a couple in a row now, and that crowd is going to be jacked up for that game. I, I, uh, I have a feeling about that. So it'll be a great game next week in Stillwater. And I think that takes care of all the Big 12 games for Week 8. I appreciate you guys checking out the latest edition of Conference Chatter TV. As always, I'll uh, talk to you guys again next week for Week 9. Until then, take care, guys. Thanks.